The Lord be with you. Very warm welcome to all of you this morning and also to those joining us online. A special welcome to visitors, newcomers and those who are returning. I can see from the back we have visitors from Scotland. A uh, very warm welcome to you and it is good to see you again. And are there any other visitors or newcomers here today? Yes, welcome to Alan uh, who has recently moved here from Plettenberg Bay. A uh, warm welcome to you and we look forward to getting to know you better as you make your home in Fishhook. Um, any other newcomers or visitors here? Yes, yes. Hello, welcome. Where have you come from? From Simonstown. Uh, welcome to you from Simonstown. I do recognize you now, yes. Um, it's very good to see you again as well. Anybody else? Wow, a lot of... Well, yes. Hello, welcome to you. Where, from where? Right. You're resident in Fishhook in, in Massey. Welcome to St. Margaret's. I hope this will be a place where you feel at home. You're very, very welcome indeed, as is everybody. Uh, that hymn spoke to us about the welcome we receive that we give to each other and the welcome we receive from Jesus when we come into his presence. We are halfway through a series of sermons on the seven sacraments of the church. And today in that series, we are considering the sacrament of confession. I'll be talking far more about that later. Um, not too much, but enough. <laughs> and, um, but today we rejoice in the fact that we come into the presence of God who has forgiven us of all our sins. The one who rejoices to see us, who runs out to meet us as the father ran out to meet the returning prodigal son. We come into his presence to be strengthened and guided and fed and then sent out on our way to breathe his life into the world around us. Praise the Lord. Praise Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us pray. To say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, 
cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Together we pray. O God, architect of our faith, build in us the assurance of our hope and the conviction of your faithfulness that we will be ready to receive the treasure of Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Stay seated for the first reading. from the book of Isaiah, starting at verse 1, and then reading from verse 10. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amot, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats, when you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbath, and convocation, I cannot hear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of, of hearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you, even if you offer many prayers. I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the cause of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, we will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and re rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. From the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Hear the word of the Lord. Thank you. 
Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. The Lord, the most mighty God, has spoken and called the world from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not keep silence. Let the heavens Consuming fire goes out before him, and a mighty tempest stirs about him. He calls the heaven above, and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful, who have sealed my covenant with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. O my people, and I will speak. I will testify against you, O Israel, for I am God, your God. I will not reprove you for your sacrifices, for your burnt offerings are always before me. that forget God, consider this well, lest I tear you apart and there is none to deliver you. Whoever offers me the sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me, and to those who keep my way will I show the salvation of God. The second reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 3 and um, 8 to 19. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, 
Abraham, when called to go to the place he would leave, uh, later receive as in his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were his heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with the foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All those people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he, was he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his only one and son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God would raise the dead and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. Listen to the Gospel of Christ according to St. Luke, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 32. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. 
If he comes in the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the Gospel of the Lord. sit. Over the past few weeks we have been thinking about the sacraments of healing, Eucharist and baptism in that order and we come today to think about the sacrament of confession. Of all the sacraments, confession is perhaps, well certainly, the one which is least understood and certainly least practiced. And there's a good reason for that. Confession is something which is very private. It's simply between you and a priest. It's not carried out in public, so nobody else sees it, unlike all the other sacraments, which are very public. There is a good reason why it is not well understood, because it is so private, and also because we, when we don't see it in front of us, all we have to rely on is what we see in the movies, and that's not a reliable guide. And you know how it looks in films. You go into a very dark, gloomy, forbidding church. And it's full of candles, because for some reason in the movies, people think church is always full of lit candles. And you find your way to this great big wooden box, which looks like a huge wardrobe with two doors in it. You go in one side, you shut the door behind you and kneel down. The priest is on the other side with the door shut. He is sitting there, and between you there is a little grill. You can't see each other but you can hear each other. The priest, this authoritarian figure, requires you to bear the worst of yourself in his presence. You have to say everything you've ever done wrong. He gives you an appropriate punishment, 500 Hail Marys or whatever it might be, sends you off with a few words of forgiveness, and then you come out feeling nothing but shame, feeling spiritually bruised and wanting never to have to do that again. That's the way it looks in the movies. But that's not the way it looks in reality, you'll be glad to know. Why does it look that way in the movies? It looks that way because so many people have a very, I would say, infantile image of God. And that's where the problem starts. If your image of God is that God is an old man in the sky, a very stern old man, who says he loves you, but actually he wields a big stick over you. And the way he works is on a reward and punishment basis. That when you do well, good things happen in your life. God rewards you. But when you do badly, he sends punishments your way. Poor health, poor finances, loss of jobs, that sort of thing, is your punishment for being so evil. That's the way many people think. And even if we laugh at that, I think there's a deep-seated reality that people think that's the way the world works and that's the way God is. He's a stern old man in the sky who sends down either rewards or punishments depending on how well we've behaved. And we need to go to confession when we've done something wrong in order to try and stave off the punishment that would otherwise come our way. We have to go to confession to plead with God not to punish us. Now, maybe that is how you've ever, you've always thought of confession, if you've ever thought about it at all. But cast all that from your minds, both that image of God and that image of confession, because neither of them convey very much truth. Let's go back to the beginning. The image of God. At the heart of our Christian understanding is that God created everything that exists, and he created it out of love. God created humanity out of love. 
and uniquely among all his creation, gave us the ability to know him, to know that we are loved by him and to love him in return. And he created us in community with each other, to love one another and give ourselves to one another in love and service. God is love and God created us out of love and for love. That is the heart of what we believe about God. Forget this stern old man in the sky business. God is love. But he gave us free will. And there begins the problem. We were not created like robots to automatically do the right thing and love and be loved. We were given the choice. And the story of Adam and Eve at the beginning of the book of Genesis symbolizes what went wrong, that we've misused our free will to make the wrong choices. We failed to love God. We failed to give ourselves in love to each other. We've preferred our own priorities to the priorities of God. And what that amounts to is sin. That's what sin is. It is putting our own priorities before those of God. Sin directs our attention away from God and towards ourselves. It builds a barrier between us and God. So the God who longs to reach out to us in love simply can't because this barrier is in the way. And the only way that it can be removed is for it to be demolished. When God wanted to demolish this wall, he came himself into our world. God himself, the creator of all that is, God who is love, became flesh. In the person of Jesus, he came to do away with sin. He came to show us a better way, the way of love. In his words and in his actions, he showed us what love actually looks like. He recalled us to that first vision of love in which he created us. Many people accepted Jesus' message and followed him and became part of the kingdom which he came to proclaim. But others did not. He was rejected. Those who did not want to hear this message ended up crucifying him. But Jesus rose from the dead. He defeated death. He showed that the old reign of sin and death was over. And he gave us the ability to be part of the new life with which he rose at Easter. When we are baptized, as I mentioned last week, we join Jesus in his death and his resurrection. The old life, the life which is separated from God by sin, is done away with, it's washed away in the waters of the font. We rise from baptism with a new life, a life which is united with God. But our baptism does not make us perfect. Our baptism simply sets us at the beginning of the path of discipleship. And on that path, which lasts a whole lifetime, we will learn what it means to love and be loved. But we will make many mistakes along the way. We do not become perfect at our baptism. We do not instantly become mature Christians at our baptism. It's only a beginning. Along the way, as we make our mistakes, if we confess them, then we are forgiven. And we are restored to that purity which was ours at our baptism. When we come to the Eucharist, time after time, week after week, we include within the Eucharist a confession of sin. What we do is, in a very general sense, to confess that we have failed, to, we have fallen short of God's glory. There is a time of preparation, a few moments of silence before we do that, where we can recall our own particular sins. And then together, we make the general confession that we have sinned in the things that we have done and in the things that we have failed to do. Then we hear the words of God's forgiveness. The priest pronounces the words of absolution. Now, for the majority of people, that is enough. You've come to the Eucharist. You've had a chance to consider your own life, to examine your conscience. And anything which is on your conscience, you have confessed in the words of the general confession, along with everybody else in church, and you've received that assurance of God's forgiveness. For most people, that is enough. But not for everyone. There are times when 
a general confession is not enough. There are times when you are burdened in your conscience by things that you've done or failed to do. There are times when it would be very helpful to be able to speak privately and confidentially to a priest. And that is where the sacrament of confession comes in. It's not obligatory for anybody, but it's, it is advisable for some. The Anglican rule of thumb on this is that all may, some should, but none must. Nobody can be compelled to make their confession in this private sense. But for those who do feel that it's helpful, then it is a great source of grace. Forget that old idea of having to sit in a wooden box and plead with God not to punish you. That's not what it's about. From the moment you feel sorry for your sin, you are forgiven already. God doesn't wait for you to say the words of confession before forgiving you. God has already forgiven you. From the moment you feel sorry, the forgiveness is there. So when you come to make your confession, what you are really doing is not pleading with God, but you are celebrating the fact that he has already forgiven you. When you mention the particular sins that are on your conscience, you're actually celebrating the fact that those sins, although they are a great burden to you, have indeed been forgiven, and you are thankful for it. It is not the priest who forgives you. It is God who has already forgiven you. That makes confession a very much more positive thing than you'll ever see in the movies. It is a celebration of God's love and forgiveness. It is painful. It is uncomfortable. It's humiliating to speak to another human being about your darkest side. But it's liberating as well. Because once you've done it, the burden is lifted and you, you understand that the slate is wiped clean and you can move on. It is tough, but it is worth it. So confession is a very much more positive thing than you may have been led to believe. But what does it actually look like in practice? You may have noticed there's no big box in this church for anyone to climb into. So how do we do it? When I have heard people's confessions here, I've simply sat side by side with them in the front row of the Lady Chapel or knelt at the altar rail. There's no box, there's nothing between us. It's simply one sinner speaking to another. You may be surprised to know that there is a service in the prayer book for this. Many people have been led to believe that this is not an Anglican practice, that it's a, a nasty Roman Catholic thing. We don't do it in this church. But it is an Anglican practice and always has been. Even in the Book of Common Prayer of 1662, upon which all our other prayer books have been based, it is there, and it always has been. If you have a prayer book at home, go home and look at it, and you will find it. It's only a few pages. It's quite hard to find. It's sandwiched in between baptism and confirmation and the catechism, just over a few pages. So do go and look at it. We're going to have a little role play now. Andrew is going to confess his sins, not his personal sins, but just in a sense of he's being an actor here. And we're going to show you exactly what the sacrament looks like when it's celebrated. So, we will come together. We will spend a few moments in silence just to, re just to collect our thoughts. And then, I will, when we're ready, I will say to him, The Lord be in your heart and on your lips that you may truly and humbly confess your sins. I confess to God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, before the whole company of heaven and before you, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and in what I have left undone, through my own fault, and especially since my last confession, I have sinned in these ways. This is where he mentions the particular things which are on his conscience. I'm not going to ask him to do that now. But it may be many or it may be few, maybe just one single thing. But whatever it is that's providing the burden on his conscience, that is what he will mention there. And then he will continue. For these and all my other sins, which I cannot now remember, or of which I am not aware, I am truly sorry. Firmly mean to do better and humbly ask pardon of God and of you, and, and of you penance, advice and absolution. Wherefore, I pray God to have mercy on me and you to pray for me to the Lord our God. 
Okay, that is the prayer of confession. Prayer in, in the general sense that we all know that we have done things and failed to do things which are wrong. But, but confession in a very specific sense, where specific things are mentioned which are burdensome. The priest will then offer some words of advice. It may be that if uh, Andrew's been coming to confession regularly and the same things keep coming up each time, there could be some words of advice or discussion about how to avoid this repetition of sin. If one of the things that's been confessed, for instance, might be that you stole something from somebody, then that advice might include, well, you need to go and give it back or make restitution in some other way if it's not possible to return what you stole. Words of advice like that about what you can do about this situation. It certainly won't be a stern lecture. Uh, it won't be putting you in your place and making you feel worse than you already feel. But simply words of advice from one sinner to another. Secondly, there may be what is referred to as penance. And again, forget what you've seen in the movies or what you imagine happens. I've never ever given any 500 Hail Marys to do. It's far more likely to be the words of a, of a helpful hymn, a few verses from a psalm or a, some other prayer. That sort of thing. And the penance is given not for you to do it in order to earn God's forgiveness, but in order to give thanks that God has forgiven you. So it will be something very positive from Scripture or from elsewhere, which celebrates with great joy the fact that you have been forgiven. And then come the words of absolution. Our Lord Jesus Christ who has left power to his church to absolve all sinners who truly repent and believe in him, of his great mercy, forgive you your offenses. And by his authority committed to me, I absolve you from all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It would then, uh, the priest would then give a blessing, and then the rite concludes with the words, Go in peace. The Lord has put away your sins. Pray for me, also a sinner. And that is it. It's very short. It's very simple. You don't have to go through any elaborate ritual. You don't have to try and earn God's forgiveness by jumping through any number of hoops. You simply come to celebrate the fact that God has already forgiven you. Confession, then, should be seen in this positive light not as something awful to be avoided at all costs, something from the medieval days. It is the reality for many people. As I said earlier, it is available for everybody. Nobody can be obliged to come to confession. If the general confession in the Eucharist is enough for your conscience, then that's fine. But it is available for anyone who wants it, and some probably should if you have particular sins that continue to burden you. Please do come and speak to me at any time if you want to arrange that. I'm not going to come and tell you that you need to do it. You must come and see me. But thanks be to God for his grace given to us in this sacrament. The grace of knowing that we are forgiven. The grace of knowing that it's not just head knowledge, it's not just what we read in a book, but knowing deep within your spirit that God has set you free from sin and purified you from all unrighteousness. Amen. We can now stand it's for the creed. We say together, I believe and trust in God the Father who made the world. I believe and trust in God's Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed humankind. I believe and trust in God's Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God. I believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Everlasting God, we give thanks for this new day. And as we gather here to worship you, we pray that we might be so filled with joy through our belief in you that our hearts overflow with love for you and for all who we meet along our journey. Creator God, we pray for your world. Forgive us when we are ungrateful. 
when spiritual blindness prevents us from appreciating your wonder of your, of your creation and the endless cycle of nature. Forgive us for taking without giving, reaping without sowing. Forgiving God, let us not hold on to our grudges. Help us to forgive others as you have forgiven us. Free us from our heavy burdens and help us to focus on you. We thank you for the love we share with our families and our friends. We recognize that we may have faults and they love us in spite of ours. Help us to be flexible and adaptable in all our relationships and also capable of accepting constructive criticism. Father God, we pray for those we know and love who do not know or acknowledge you. We pray, Father, that you will that they will sorry that they will hear you and will respond to your call. We pray that all who hear you speaking will answer in a positive way. Loving God, we pray for all those who are worn out and weary for whatever reason, in sickness, pain, grief, or just the daily struggles of life. In a moment of quiet, please bring before God anyone on your mind. We pray that in the midst of their suffering and pain, we with the Holy Spirit will be able to bring them love, healing, support, and the hope they need. Gracious God, the Lord of life, look in mercy on the departed that they may see your salvation and find their peace and final rest in you and grant peace to those who mourn them. We especially remember those in our own families and in our parish. Faithful God, we thank you for the opportunity of being together in prayer as we look forward to the week to come. We pray for an awareness of your love and support in all we do. Merciful Father, accept these our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. We say together, Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word and deed and by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, O Lord. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the selfishness, hypocrisy, and impatience of our lives. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our exploitation of other people. Our apathy and indifference, and our acceptance of oppression. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. For our waste and pollution of your creation, and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Accomplish in us the work of your salvation. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord. To the joy of Christ's resurrection.
resurrection. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon your sins, and set you free from them. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. For us, it becomes the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. For us, it becomes the cup of salvation. God of mercy and compassion, your word calls us home to faith and love. Accept all we offer you this day in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. 
thoughts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, it is our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. He is the Word through whom you made the universe, the Saviour you sent to redeem us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake, he opened his arms on the cross. He put an end to death and revealed the resurrection. In this, he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. And now we give you thanks, because he was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil, and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. And so we join the angels and the saints in proclaiming your glory as we say, Lord, you are holy indeed, the fountain of all holiness. Let your Spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before he was given up to death, a death he freely accepted, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again he gave you thanks and praise, gave the cup to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. So we proclaim the mystery of faith. memory of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, this life-giving bread, this saving cup. We thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. May all of us who share in the body and blood of Christ be brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church throughout the world. Make us grow in love, together with Margaret, our bishop, and all the clergy. Remember our brothers and sisters who have gone to their rest in the hope of rising again. Bring them and all the departed into the light of your presence. Have mercy on us all. Make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with the Apostles, 
and with all the saints who have done your will throughout the ages. May we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Let us pray with confidence to the Father in the words our Saviour taught us. The bread which we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow, says the Lord. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Draw near and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Feed on him in your hearts, by faith, with thanksgiving.
please stand. <laughs> Give thanks, for the Lord is gracious. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us both a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace that we may always most thankfully receive these his inestimable gifts and also daily endeavor to follow the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please sit. We have uh, a bumper crop of birthdays to celebrate this week. Uh, today, it is the birthdays of Christiane van der Beel and Sandra Schut. And then later in the week, Olivia Plowden, Pauline Jackson, J.P. LaRue, Anthea Booth, Mary Carrick. Is Mary here today? I think so. Yes, Mary, you're here. Congratulations to you. Jeanette Pepper, Leah Rushworth, Please pass our best wishes on to Leah for a few days' time. Mary Ball, Doug Logan. Doug is here, I think. Yes, we are Doug. Kitana, Daria Gorton, and Kevin Robinson. Uh, Moira, please pass our best wishes on to Kevin. Uh, prayers and best wishes for all those who are celebrating birthdays this week. May God's love be with you. May you know his grace in your lives today and into the year ahead. And we also celebrate the anniversary of David and Lynn Trimmel. Congratulations to the two of you on your coming anniversary. We pray for you and for all those who are celebrating their anniversaries now, uh, that God's love will continue to grow in your lives and in your marriage and will continue to grow, pass out through you into your family and beyond. There's quite a few things to draw your attention to um, on the announcements. Uh, but before we come to any of them, I want the Sunday school children to come up and tell us about what they've been doing in Sunday school today. It may take a while because I, I can see there's lots of them. <laughs> Please come up and show us what you've been doing. If you made something, then bring it up, otherwise just come yourself. Right, who's going to tell us what you're holding, what you've been making today? Chloe, what have you been making? The lantern. These are very clued up children. They know that sooner or later it's going to be load shedding again. <laughs> and. <laughs> And they've been prepared. And I think that was probably what the, the lesson was about today, wasn't it? Being prepared. Uh, what, what's that all about? Have you got anything inside your lanterns? Have you got something in there? Is it a generator? <laughs> no. <laughs> what have you got? Tell us what you've got. You, you've got some words. What's on yours, Alex? That, that's, Alex has got the word love in hers. What's yours? Kindness. What have you got? Chloe. Read the Bible. Excellent. You've got the same words. There's quite a few words, aren't there? And I think you've probably all got the same words. So what are the, what's that got to do with lanterns? Who can tell us what the meaning of all that is? Anybody? Sorry. Oh, you've got all your words there, Christian. Well done. Right, what's it all about? The reading that we heard earlier from the Gospel was about being ready for Jesus, wasn't it? So... It's all about being ready. Have your lamps lit, he said. Just as if you were expecting somebody to come in the middle of the night, have your lamp ready to welcome them. We get ready when we have those things. Love, forgiveness, kindness, reading the Bible, those sorts of things are what we do to get ready for Jesus. So that's a lovely lesson, isn't it? You can take those home and you can be reminded about what you did today. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sunday School, and thank you for all the teachers. It's wonderful, isn't it, to see so many children in our Sunday School. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you all. 
Okay, you can all go and sit down again with your parents. Right. You staying there, Emily? You can stay there if you want. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. She can stay. It's fine. Right, this month, the month of August, is the month of compassion, as you know. Over past years, we've tended to have a collection of clothing and warm blankets during the month of compassion. But we did that earlier in the year um, with our 50 days of gratitude appeal after Easter. So we're not going to do that again. Instead, during the month of August, we're asking you to befriend somebody who may be lonely. If you know of somebody who lives alone or is lonely for some other reason and just needs some company, some support and encouragement, please just reach out to them. Maybe just have a cup of coffee with them one day, or a meal, or go for a walk, or do whatever seems appropriate. But look out for somebody who is in need in that way, somebody who is lonely. That, I think, is a, is a compassionate gesture, and will really make a big difference to somebody who does live alone. In addition to that, as you hopefully know, we have a church benevolent fund. It was established many years ago by the AWF and the parish council, and is administered by trustees from within the church. And that exists in order to help people within the membership of the church who are facing a sudden financial difficulty. We've had many calls on this fund over the last couple of years, and the fund is now running quite low. In order to be able to continue helping people in need, we need to top that fund up. If you are willing to make a donation to that fund, it will be very much appreciated. Maybe that could be what you do during the month of compassion if you can't uh, do anything to reach out to those who are lonely. You may simply be able to make a financial donation instead, and that will be fine. If you do, then please make your donation in whichever way is easiest for you, but make sure that Marjorie knows that it's for the Benevolent Fund. That way we can build our fund up a bit and be able to support people when they need it. Thank you. Also on the theme of compassion, you hopefully have heard by now of the Ministry of U-Turn, um, an organization which is, exists in many parts of Cape Town, especially in the southern suburbs, and now in Fishhook as well, and works among the homeless. I've spoken to you before about what they do. They're now fully established in Fishhook. They haven't yet got a permanent place, but they operate from that big white double-decker bus behind the Caltex garage. If you've been down there, you'll have seen it. That's where they operate from, and that's where they do their work. We are engaging with U-Turn um, to encourage people to give responsibly to the homeless and the street people of our community. An example of what they would refer to as responsible giving is by not giving cash or money, uh, and not giving cash or food indiscriminately to whoever asks for it, but instead giving them a U-Turn voucher. A voucher can then be taken by that person down to the big white bus and it can be exchanged for a meal or for clothing. In other parts of Cape Town where they've been established a bit longer, there are other things available like a shower um, or a bed for the night. They haven't yet got that facility in Fishhook. But um, food and clothing is available at that white bus. So what they're asking us to do is to instead of giving indiscriminately money or food, buy the vouchers which you can buy from our office because we've now got a supply of them. Buy some vouchers, and then when somebody asks you for a handout, you give them the voucher. That voucher then entitles them to go to U-Turn and redeem it for food or clothing, but at the same time, they start to engage with U-Turn, who try to help them back into mainstream society, getting them ready for work, overcoming addictions if they have addictions, and so on. Trying to get them back into a place where they are employable again. Just by giving indiscriminately cash or food, it enables people simply to stay quite comfortably on the streets. But if you give the vouchers, then they have to engage with U-Turn's program. It may sound like tough love, and perhaps it is, but it's the responsible way of trying to resolve the homelessness problem in Fishhook and beyond. So please come to the office during the week and buy some vouchers. They cost 50 rands for a pack of four. And you can give those vouchers either to four different people or all four to the same person. It's up to you but 50 rands for a pack of four, purchasable from the office, and then if somebody asks you, you can give them a voucher and explain to them where they can go to the, get the U-turn services. Yeah. Caltex garage on main road. 
Yeah. You know where the BP garage is? It's the opposite corner to that. Um, so send them down to the big white bus with a voucher, and they will have something to eat and something to wear. Um, so during office hours, Tuesday to Friday, please go and buy them from Madre. On Saturday, we have a training session for our servers. We're going to rebuild our serving team. Uh, some of those who have done it before, and quite a number of new ones who have never done it before. So please come together if you can on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock in church. It'll be for about an hour, I expect. won't be too long. Uh, just to do some training and to try and rebuild our serving team. Some of you will know that we now have an alarm on the church, a burglar alarm. And if you open that door, the vestry door, without unsetting the alarm, then you will see lots of flashing red lights and hear a very loud alarm going off. If you have a key to the church, then you need to know how to operate the alarm. Um, we've had one or two alarms going off this week by those who have not been aware of it. But if you have a key, please speak to Madre, and she will get you a remote which enables and disables the alarm. Uh, we don't want to give the key code to too many people, but um, if, you, if you have keys and you really need to get into the church, then you need a remote. An even better way of doing it is if you have a remote, you have one of your home remotes, and you have a spare button on it that's not used for anything else, that can be programmed to operate this alarm. Um, that will save us the cost of buying another remote. So that's an even better way of doing it. But um, there may be people who have keys, and we don't know you've got keys. If you try and sneak in unnoticed, you will set the alarm off. <laughs> so <laughs> you will be found out. <laughs> so it's much better just to come clean and say, I've got a key, I need to know how the alarm works. And there will be no recriminations. We've been talking today about forgiveness. You will be forgiven. We, we just need to know who you are. With the return of Sunday school, we have to decide what we do with our young family services. Before we started Sunday school, we had a young family service once a month on a Sunday afternoon. We can still continue with that, but if we do, it's going to be aimed at the very youngest children, the under fives, so that we don't duplicate what happens in Sunday school. But we're only going to do it if there is a demand for it. So if you think you would come to that service once a month with children under the age of five, then let us know. Because if there isn't really any demand for it, then we won't do it. We don't want to do something which isn't wanted. So please speak to me or speak to Joy Rushworth and let us know if you want that service. And if we don't, it's fine. We'll just have that Sunday afternoon off. Okay. After this service, there will be tea in the church hall. Please go over there and continue some fellowship. And also after the service, there is the opportunity to pray with a lay minister. Andrew will go to the Lady Chapel, and if you wish him to pray with you, about anything at all in a private, confidential way, please make your way over there, and he will happily do that. Thank you. Would you please stand? We have been ransomed, healed, restored, and forgiven, and we are now sent out to bring Christ's forgiveness to the world. So we pray together. Father Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Send us out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. God bless Africa. Guard our children. Guide our leaders and give us peace. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. The Lord be with you. God, who from the death of sin raised you to new life in Christ, keep you from falling and set you in the presence of his glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.
Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.